Hello, welcome back to Planet 40K. We've got another two part series for you. Start with today's video, which is how to score with Necrons. So we're gonna be going through all the secondary objectives available to us Necron players. And we're gonna be going through some strategies and the best ways of actually scoring with those secondary objectives. Now, part two of this series is gonna be how to deny points to your opponents. Again, using the Necron Codex. But for this video today, we're going to be talking about the actual scoring. So before getting into today's video, a quick shout out to Patrick Laurie for joining the Elite membership within our members area. And if you haven't already, there should be a blue button below. Click the join button for more information on this membership. Okay, so back onto the video. So in the new chapter approved book, that's where you're going to be finding your latest secondary objectives. Now there are of course five categories where you're going to be selecting your secondary objectives. And at the most, you can only select one single objective per category. So the five categories are Purge the Enemy, No Mercy, No Respite, Warcraft, Battlefield Supremacy and Shadow Operations. So we're going to start with Purge the Enemy. Now there are three options within Purge the Enemy that you can select from as a Necron player. The first one being Assassination, the second one being Bring It Down and the third one being Code of Combat. So Assassination, what is Assassination to begin? You're scoring three victory points at the end of the battle for each enemy character unit that was destroyed. And if the enemy warlord was destroyed, you're going to be gaining an additional victory point. So of course, you're going to want to be taking this Assassination secondary objective if your opponent is taking a few characters within their list. Now, if they've only got one, two, or even three characters within their entire list, the maximum you can score from, say, three characters is 10 points. If you're okay with scoring 10 points, then yeah, Assassination is for you, but if they've only got one or two characters, then maybe look elsewhere. So when we're talking about characters, we need to think about what kind of units are going to be dealing with actual characters in the opposing player's list. The first thing that comes to mind for me is our death marks. Now with their sniper ability, they get to ignore the lookout sir rule, which means that the actual enemy characters can be targeted. Whereas normally if there are three models or a monster or a vehicle within close proximity of that character, then you can't target the actual character with those shooting attacks. So this ignores that rule, and then furthermore, any wound rolls of a 6 will inflict a single mortal wound on top of the damage. Now this works particularly well if you're playing with the Mephrit Dynasty, using the stratagem Talent for Annihilation for 1 command point. Any wound rolls of a 6 will inflict a mortal wound, so very similar to the actual ability that the actual death marks have with their ranged weapons. So they're going to be stacking together, so any 6s to wound will now actually inflict 2 mortal wounds when you use this stratagem. Now when you've got a full unit of 10 of these death marks, this stratagem is going to work quite nicely and you're going to be getting that character down, maybe even remove it off the table within a few turns. Now the second group of units that comes to mind when we're talking about characters and removing characters is the Katarn Shards. Now I wanted to use the example here of the Katarn Shard of the Nightbringer and it's with the Katarn Powers in particular because it's not a shooting attack and it's not a melee attack. So it's done in the movement phase so therefore you can select character models with your Katarn Powers providing that the actual Katarn Power rule actually lets you. Now some of the actual Katarn Power rules will specifically say that you can't target characters or it's going to be the closest eligible unit. So you've got to look at the wording for each Katarn Power before you're actually selecting a character to take out. But as an example here, the Gaze of Death Katarn Power with the Nightbringer, you select one enemy unit within 9 inches and visible, roll 3d6 and for every 4 plus the unit can suffer d3 mortal wounds. So in this case it does not matter if that character has a lookout sir bubble attached to the character himself as long as he's within 9 inches of the Nightbringer and visible, you could potentially do a maximum of 9 mortal wounds to that single character model. Now if you didn't fancy using the Katarn powers to take out your characters, you've still got your melee attacks with the Nightbringer, the Entropic Blow profile in particular, which is strength times 2, so that's strength 14, minus 4 AP and D6 damage. No invulnerable saves can be made against these attacks, and if you go to his Drain Life ability, there's also no feel, no pain saves that can be made against these attacks. So effectively there's no saves whatsoever, now unless they start off on a 2 plus armor save, so they will get a 6 plus armor save. But when you've got 6 attacks that hit on 2s and pretty much wound on 2s, there's going to be a lot of damage. D6 a piece, you're going to very easily remove characters this way. Now you don't even have to use the Nightbringer, you can use say for example a Void Dragon who's actually got a shooting attack as well as a melee attack, although it is only at 12 inch range with a shooting attack, both at strength 9, minus 4 OP and D6 damage. Now it hasn't got the same ability to ignore invun saves and also the feel no pain saves, but you do have a stratagem at your disposable, although it is 2 command points, so it's a little bit pricey. But in the fight phase you select Katarn Shard model, and when you're using melee attacks against an enemy model, they cannot use their invun saves. So very similar to the Nightbringer's actual inbuilt rule, but you can also use this with the Void Dragon and the Deceiver as well, although the Deceiver isn't as punchy as a Void Dragon. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is Bring It Down. So this is an end game objective, 
at the end of the battle score victory points for each enemy monster or vehicle that is destroyed and you're getting points for how many wounds the models actually have so scoring one point if they've got a wounds characteristic of 9 or less, 2 points if they've got a wounds characteristic of 10 to 14, 3 points for 15 and 19 wounds, and 4 points for 20 or more wounds. Now there's only a few occasions where you're really going to be selecting this objective. The first one is if you're going up against Chaos Knights or Imperial Knights, because these models will have 20 plus wounds, so every time you take one of these knights out, you're going to be scoring 4 victory points. Now you don't just have to be going up against Imperial Knights or Chaos Knights to be able to take Bring It Down. For example, if you're going against Astra Militarum, normally there's quite a lot of tanks and vehicles when you're playing against the Astra Militarum. Now, they don't have 20 plus wounds on most of their tanks. They're more like 10, 11, 12 kind of wounds. So you're going to be scoring two points per tank. But with that, you only need to take out, say, five of them to be gaining 10 victory points there. Now, very similarly, sometimes when you go up against Tau, there's quite a lot of vehicles. And if you're going up against Demons, there's usually quite a lot of monster models. Now they're soon going to be getting their new codex. So who knows what kind of shenanigans we're going to be seeing from the demon faction. But when you're taking out monsters and vehicle models from enemy factions, you need to look at our anti-tank weaponry within our own Necron Codex. And you don't need to look any further than the Locust Heavy Destroyers. Now we've already done a video on why these are the best anti-tank option within our heavy support section. So if you haven't already checked that one out, check out our Necron playlist and you'll find it. It's quite a recent video, so you won't need to scroll too far down to find that one. But yeah, having damage 3d3 with the Gauss Destructors is really powerful. And if you're taking a couple of units of these, maybe even three units of these in the larger games, they're going to be really effective. Okay, so the last one on this section is Code of Combat. End game objective, at the end of the battle, three victory points for each enemy unit that was destroyed at range by a Necron's Noble, and then you're scoring four victory points if an enemy unit was destroyed by a Necron's Noble in melee. And in addition, if you take out a character, you gain a command point, fair dues. Now, so this is really specifically built for the Silent King. If you're taking the Silent King, you should pretty much always be using Code of Combat. With the amount of weapons that the Silent King actually has, it's got a whole range of weapons in terms of strength as well, loads of attacks. And the standout range attack in particular is the Annihilator Beam. You've got two of those, strength 12 minus 4 AP and a flat 6 damage. So you can be quite easily removing units with the Silent King. Now you don't need to just use the Silent King in order to be scoring with Code of Combat. You could be taking the Catacomb Command Barges or the Overlords on foot for example. And very simply just equip them with a War Scythe, maybe upgrade it to the Void Reaper for that flat 3 damage that ignores feel no pain saves. Now other nobles in our codex are the named characters such as Imatek the Stormlord. Now you do have to be playing a specific dynasty code to be using Imatek the Stormlord. Now there are other characters that are dynastic agents but you don't get to select their war gear and not all of them are that punchy in melee. So from the Purge the Enemy list, out of the three here, I would definitely lean towards Code of Combat. You kind of know where you stand, especially if you're building your own list. You know exactly what's going to be happening. Whereas if you go into a game and you've already pre-selected Assassination in your mind, and then you come up against only two character models, you've kind of got to change your game plan. And likewise with Bring It Down, the same thing applies there. If you don't know who you're going up against, it could be a complete waste of time. So Code of Combat is where I'd begin, and maybe use the other ones dependent on your opponent's list. Now onto the next category, which is No Mercy, No Respite. So you've got three options again, you've got Grind Them Down, No Prisoners, and the Treasures of Aeons. Now with Grind Them Down, which is the first one, it's a progressive objective. You score three victory points at the end of the battle round if more enemy units than friendly units have been destroyed this battle round. So going second does have a slight advantage with Grind Them Down because you kind of know what you've got to achieve. If your opponent's gone first and they've managed to kill two of your units in their turn, you're going second, you now have some information. You need to kill three enemy models in order to score Grind Them Down for that battle round. If you know you're not going to do it that battle round, then I'd probably just try to minimize as many units as possible for the next battle round because that's the one disadvantage with grind them down is maybe you remove way too many models too early maybe your opponent only removes one of your units and you go removing say five of theirs you only needed to remove two of theirs to score but you've now removed a lot more units so there's going to be less of your opponent's units in the game for the later battle rounds in play. So it's a little bit more tricky this one to score and you just need to make sure you've got units within your list that can actually remove enemy models at will. So for example you've got your Scorpic Destroyers, your Locust Heavy Destroyers, well mainly all the Destroyers really. They've got the capability of removing a unit when they want to remove a unit. Necron Warriors can also do it, especially with the Veil of Darkness Relic and the Gauss Reapers. So there's plenty of other options within our Necron Codex that you can be using in order to score grind them down. So next on the list we've got no prisoners which is an end game objective. If you select this objective keep a kill points tally each time an enemy model is destroyed 
Add the number of marks to the tally equal to the wounds characteristics of the destroyed model. Then at the end of the battle, divide the kill points by 10, rounding down. And then that will be the amount of victory points you're going to be scoring. And then in addition, if you get between 59 to 9 kill points, you get an additional point. 100 or more, you're going to be scoring 2 additional points. Now bear in mind that this does exclude vehicle models, monster models as well as character models. So ideally you want to be taking this secondary objective if you know you're going up against a horde type of army. We've got some examples of some horde type armies, you've got the Tyranids, you've got the Orcs as well as some demons. Now they won't necessarily be bringing hordes if you're going to be going up against those factions but they do have the option of taking horde units. Just like the Necrons have when you take 3 lots or 20 man warrior blobs we've also got that option. So how do you deal with horde units using the Necron Codex to be able to score no prisoners? Well you kind of need anti-infantry weapons and we've got quite a lot in our actual codex. So we've got a few examples here again on the screen for you. All of these options are going to be anti-infantry weapons and if you're able to get Tesla on some of these weapons even better because you don't really need the AP when you're going up against horde units because they've already got a low armor save. So ideally you want more hits with those exploding sixes and therefore more wounds and more models removed. Now I just thought I'd throw this synergy in here while we're at this stage of the video. Taking Hexmark Destroyer and using the Relic, the Gauntlet of the Conflagrator, it can be used alongside his actual pistols and it can be taking out a lot of models. Because it automatically hits and you don't even need to roll to wound, you just simply roll a d6 for every single model in the unit and any sixes will score a mortal wound and likely removing a single model. So if you're going up against say a 30 man orc boy unit, on average you're going to be scoring 5 mortal wounds there and that's before any actual ranged attacks are made with his disintegrator pistols. Now you can be using his pistols alongside the relic because of course they've all got the pistol profile. So the main aim when you're taking no prisoners, anti-infantry weapons, try and do it in mass and pretty much just remove models, that way you're going to be getting the highest amount of kill points. If you're going up against an elite army or a lot of vehicles, a lot of monsters or a lot of characters, don't even bother taking this secondary, it's not going to be worth it. Next we come on to one of the Necron specific ones which is the Treasures of Aeons. Now this is a progressive objective, select this objective during the resolve pre-battle ability step of the mission, your opponent must select 3 objective markers on the battlefield, while doing so they cannot select any objective markers that are in their own deployment zone, unless they've selected all the objective markers that are in the no man's land. Then at the end of the turn you score victory points if you control one or more of these selected objectives as shown in the table. So if you're holding one of these objectives you're going to be scoring 2 points, if you're holding 2 of them you're going to be scoring 3 points and then if you're holding 3 of them you're going to be scoring 5 points. Now something to note when you're looking at this secondary objective is the fact that your opponent cannot be putting any treasures of Aeons in their own deployment zone. So you know pretty much where they're going to be going, they're going to be going in the no man's land. Now of course if there's only 2 objectives in the no man's land then unfortunately there will be one more in their deployment zone but at the very least there will be two in the no man's land so you kind of know what you've got to be doing. For me this is like a Necron version of Stranglehold which was in the previous chapter approved book. Now if you were to take the secondary objective then really you need to be using some sort of objective secured dynasty so the Nihilak dynasty or maybe Eternal Conquerors from the custom dynasties. That way you're going to pretty much almost be certain that you're actually holding the objectives. Now when you are holding objectives with the treasures of Aeons you kind of need to make sure you've got some tanky resilient models actually holding the objective because even with objective secured if your unit gets wiped off the objective then you're not going to be scoring. That one's kind of obvious but for me what you need to be doing is looking at your canoptic scabs, your canoptic spiders, maybe even your canoptic wraith as well with their rimbun save. You can look at really tanky models from the vehicle section such as the ghost arcs or maybe you want some toughness 5 infantry models such as the Lich Guard with a sword and shield, so they've got a 2 plus armor save with that 4 plus invulnerable save. But yeah, pretty much anything in your list that has objectives secured is going to work really nicely, even if it's an Annihilation Barge, Catacomb Command Barge, they're going to be pretty hard to shift. So I would highly advise taking Treasures of Aeons because it's quite an easy one to achieve and it does align quite nicely with your actual primaries because you're going to be scoring your primaries as well as your secondaries all at the same time. So out of the three options from the No Mercy No Respite list I would highly advise going for the Treasures of Aeons. You know exactly where you stand and you can plan for it pre-game whereas the other two options you kind of can't plan for it. You've got to pretty much look at your opponent's list, know what you're going up against before actually selecting it. Don't get me wrong, if you see your opponent's list and they've got a horde type of army, yeah, go for no prisoners, but most of the time, Treasure of Aeons is the way to go. Okay, the next section of the video is the Warpcraft section. Now, there are three options available, which is Abba the Witch, Warp Ritual, and Psychic Interrogation. However, the Warp Ritual and Psychic Interrogation options are specifically for psychic models within our faction, and of course, Necrons don't have any psychers. So only Abba the Witch is going to be available to Necron players. Now it's an end game objective and we're going to be scoring 3 victory points at the end of the battle for each enemy psychic character unit that was destroyed 
and two victory points for any Psyker units that were destroyed. So it's quite similar to Assassination in one sense, however you do need to remember that it isn't just about characters, there are Psyker units available in the game. For example in the Tyranids Codex we've got the Zonethropes, they're Psykers. From the new Chaos Demons book we've got the Horrors. From the Thousand Suns we've got the Rubik Marines. And from the Grey Knights we've got the Paladins. Now they're just a few examples, there's still actually plenty more within each of those codexes and other codexes in the actual 40k game. So taking out psychic characters as well as psychic units, again I'm going to go back to those death marks because you can snipe off those character models, ignoring that lookout ser ability and again potentially using that stratagem as mentioned earlier. But all in all this is just pretty much an assassination secondary, so as long as you've got some killer units you'll be able to score this one. If you're going up against psychic factions then yeah, this one isn't a bad option, but what I would advise doing is counting up how many psychic characters and how many psychic units that you're going up against and count how many victory points are actually available because sometimes it may look like there's a lot of psychic models but once you start to add up the actual victory points that are available to you to score in that game sometimes it's not as much as you think. So from the Warcraft options of course Abba the Witch is the one that I would be selecting. Now as for Battlefield Supremacy You've got behind the enemy lines, engage on all fronts and purge the vermin which is the Necron specific one there. So behind the enemy lines is a progressive objective and you're scoring two victory points at the end of your turn. If one unit from your army is wholly within your opponent's deployment zone and you're going to be scoring four victory points at the end of the turn if you've got two units from your army that are wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. Now this does not include any aircraft models so no night scythes, no doom scythes and you can be scoring this from turn one. Now there's a few tricks in order to be able to score this quite easily, now the first one being the dimensional translocation ability that is attached to some of our data sheets. So it's effectively a deep strike from turn 2 onwards you're coming in more than 9 inches away and you're setting yourself up on the battlefield. Now we've got a few units in the codex that have that, so you've got the flayed ones, you've got the hex mark destroyer who can also do it, even the canoptic plasma site if you wanted to, that could potentially get you 2 units in there to maximise that 4 points per turn. Then of course the death marks we've had a few mentions in this video already. Then further to add to this you've got the Ophidian destroyers who don't have that ability however they've got their own ability which is the tunneling horrors ability it's virtually the exact same thing. So yeah you can be bringing that canoptic plasma site in with the Ophidian destroyers they're coming in with different abilities that are pretty much the same ability but that will be two units in your enemy deployment zone. Now there are other strategies in order to score this secondary objective one being the Veil of Darkness relic and this one could be used from turn one so you of course get in your character model with a relic and then you're taking a core unit within three inches of the character model and you're setting them up on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy models just bear in mind that they've got to stay wholly within six inches of one another when you're redeploying so that would be two units in your opponent's deployment zone so again being able to score four victory points in a given battle round for behind enemy lines now there are some other strategies like for example if you go into the dynasty codes with the Nephric Dynasty you've got the Translocation Crypt Stratagem for a command point and you can effectively give that Dimensional Translocation ability to any unit that's not a vehicle or monster. Now this used to be pretty good before the chapter approved rules came out but now that command points pre-game are at a premium this one isn't going to be used as often. Other strategies would involve having say a Ghost Arc for example because it's got that 12 inch movement you can stick some Necron Warriors inside the Ghost Arc well in fact you have to nowadays if you're deploying a ghost arc it needs to have a unit embarked in the actual transport to be able to deploy but yeah you zip this across the battlefield by sort of turn two turn three that's going to be two quite resilient units one hiding inside a transport and yeah you're going to be scoring four victory points that way then the final option i wanted to give you is using strategic reserves again it's going to be quite hard to do nowadays because of that cp premium pre-game and there are some restrictions when using strategic reserves early in the game as well so you can't of course use any in battle round one but battle round two you can but you have to be set up six inches from any battlefield edge but you can't be in the enemy deployment zone in battle round two however in battle round three you can be in the enemy deployment zone but still not using their battlefield edge so there are restrictions and of course you're spending command points to do that but that is another option for you. Now the next one on this list engage on all fronts scoring two victory points at the end of your turn if you have one or more qualifying units from the army wholly within three different table quarters and all of those units are more than six inches away from other table quarters. Furthermore you can score three victory points instead if you have one or more qualifying units from your army wholly within each quarter of the table and again you've got that six inch restriction from each and every quarter. Now a qualifying unit is a unit that has a starting strength of three or more models 
or one that contains either one vehicle or one monster. Now that has a slight change in the wording from the previous chapter approved. What that means is you could have a five man flayed one unit for example, maybe they're being whittled down to only one single model, but they can still score engage in all fronts because their starting strength was more than three models. It was actually five. So even though there's only one model remaining, that model can still be scoring. Whereas if you're taking say a Hexmark Destroyer, that's only one model, so that has not got a starting strength of three or more and likewise with the Canoptic Plasma Sight. So this does have a slight difference to behind enemy lines. Now you're going to be using similar strategies, again Ghost Arcs with Warriors inside, quite a resilient unit, but really you just want resilient units in all quarters. That's the way you're going to be scoring Engage in all fronts. Then the last one from this category is Purge the Vermin, which is the Necron specific one. A lot of people favour this one out of all of the Necron options. So you score one victory point for each table quarter that has no enemy units wholly within it, and that excludes aircrafts. And then furthermore, you're scoring one victory point if there are no enemy units wholly within your deployment zone. Again, excluding aircrafts. So depending on the actual map that you're playing and the mission, some maps will benefit Purge the Vermin more than others. For example, if you're playing in a map type that has four different quarters, and one of those quarters is a deployment zone and another one is another deployment zone, that's going to have a smaller deployment zone. So you're likely going to be scoring an additional victory point because your opponent is not likely going to be in your actual deployment zone. It's going to be a lot easier to screen off. Whereas if you're going in a mission that is cut into threes, like in the image shown, you've got a larger deployment zone, it's harder to screen it as well. So yeah, if you're playing in the quarters deployment zone, it's very easy to get your canoptic scab swarms to be swarming off the sides of the actual deployment zone itself. Put a few units within your actual deployment zone and your opponent is not likely going to be getting inside so therefore you're going to be scoring one point because they're not in your deployment zone and then another point because they're not in that quarter either so if you can defend just that quarter alone that's going to be two points per turn which is going to actually come up to 10 points so you can see why this secondary is really attractive because like i said just defending one single quarter can potentially score you 10 points if you can further branch out to another quarter and defend that one you should easily max out the 15 point threshold. Now to further add to this secondary objective, if you see a single enemy model in a quarter, they're the ones you should be targeting because once you remove that single model or a weak unit, it doesn't have to be one single model, if you remove a weak model or a weak unit from a quarter, that entire quarter is now going to be scoring. So yeah, out of the battlefield supremacy options, I would definitely be taking Purge the Vermin every time. Okay, so we're on to the last chapter in this video, which is the Shadow Operations list. Now, it has been whittled down to three options. We've got Raise the Banners High, Retrieve Nephilim Data, and Ancient Machineries. So before getting into all three of these options, I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of the Protocol of Sudden Storm, Directive 2, if a unit is performing an action, it can still make range attacks without the action actually failing. Now, if you plan on taking any of these secondary objectives that we're about to go through, I'd highly recommend using Protocol of Sudden Storm as your permanent protocol throughout the entire game. Being able to do range attacks without the actions failing is really strong. Now, of course, you may just have a melee-based dynasty or just a load of melee units, then this isn't going to come into play too much. But if you've got some shooter units within your list, then yeah. Protocol of Sunstorm Directive 2 is the way to go. So the first option from the Shadow Operations list is Raise the Banners High, a progressive and endgame objective. In order to do the secondary, you need to be doing an action with one or more infantry units in the movement phase. Now you do need to be controlling that objective and you score one victory point at the end of each of your command phases and one at the end of the battle for each objective marker on the battlefield that has your banners raised upon it. Now note that you can do this more than once in a given turn and even just holding one single banner from turn one right the way up to the end of the game will actually score you six points. One for every single turn then one for at the end of the game. So even though it's only one single point per banner you get a couple of these things up you're going to be scoring quite well. Now of course, very similar to some of the previous secondary objectives we've spoken about today, then the Hillac Dynasty or Eternal Conquerors is going to be huge for this secondary objective in particular because you need to actually control the objective. So even if there's enemy models nearby, if you control the objective, you can simply do the action regardless of enemy models that are close by. Now you specifically want to be raising the banners in your own deployment zone to begin with. And if you are able to venture out into some nearby objectives in the mid ground, then yeah, do that too. Ideally, you want to be doing this with Necron Immortals, Necron Warriors. They have objectives secured naturally, but with that Nihilak Dynasty or Eternal Conquerors, you're going to be considered to have double the amount of actual models for holding those objectives. Now, furthermore, you can do this with Death Marks or Immortals. They're also infantry models. They've got the Deep Strike ability, so you can be taking away some objectives from your opponent further out of field. Again, raise those banners high 
potentially you could be using that command protocol of sudden storm with those death marks to still be able to fire as well. Other options include the Lich Guard which are pretty tanky with their shields or you could even use the Locust Destroyers. Again using the protocol of sudden storm make sure they're firing. Now this isn't just limited to units you could also use a character model because the characters are also infantry models so if you've got say a Chronomancer or a Necron Lord for example if they're standing around not doing much then yeah get these guys to do it just bear in mind though that their abilities will now turn off. Now onto the next one in this list we've got Retrieve Nephilim Data. This hasn't seen any changes apart from the actual name change. It's an end game objective and it's an action that requires one infantry or one biker unit. In the movement phase they're going to be performing the action. They've got to be wholly within a table quarter that has not had a servo skull retrieved from your army and also they need to be six inches away from another table quarter and it's going to be completed at the end of the turn providing the unit is still in their table quarter. If completed you roll a d6 subtract one from the result if the completed action has the troops battlefield roll and if the result is less or equal to the number of models currently in the unit the table quarter is said to have a servo skull retrieved by your army and you plus one to your retrieved data tally. So at the end of the battle you score four victory points if your tally is at two, eight victory points if your tally is at three and if you get all four quarters you're going to be scoring 12 points. So in your own quarters again it's going to be your immortals, it's going to be your necron warriors. You've also got the option again of using the death marks and your flayed ones to get those quarters at the complete opposite side of your deployment zone. So the far end quarters they're going to be quite difficult to score unless you have a deep striking unit. Now if you are using those units just bear in mind they're not troops so you're not going to be subtracting one from the dice so if you've got a five man unit of flayed ones or a five man unit of death marks and you roll a six at the end of the turn then you're going to have failed to retrieve the servo skull and you're going to have to redo it on your next turn. Now also bear in mind that this isn't just limited to infantry models it's biker models as well so now all of a sudden your toon blades can get involved in this and they can get into those distant quarters and they're pretty cheap now as well because they've had a points reduction recently. But another thing to note here, the maximum you can score with this secondary objective is 12. It's not 15 here, it's only 12. Even if you get all four quarters, you can only score a maximum of 12 points. Now onto the final one, which is Ancient Machineries. This one's in the Necron Codex, and it's an action that can be done by Necron Core and Necron Canoptic units. So done in the movement phase, core or canoptic units perform the action if they're within range of an objective marker that is not within your deployment zone. Now you do need to control the objective and if you've got objectives secured then the action will be completed on your turn otherwise it's going to be completed at the start of the next command phase. So again this is going to be really beneficial if you're using the Nihilic Dynasty or Eternal Conquerors or just having a troop choice to do this action because if they're not troops and they're not Eternal Conquerors or Nihilic then yeah, you've got to wait until your next command phase and potentially you can be shot off the actual objective. Therefore, that action is going to be completely gone and you're not going to be scoring ancient machineries. Every time you do this, you're going to be scoring four victory points. So this one does open the door for canoptic units such as canoptic scarabs, spiders and even canoptic wraiths. But also there's a lot more core units within the game. All the vehicles have now got the core keyword. Even the Silent King himself has the core keyword. So there's a lot more options for you to be able to do ancient machineries. And going back to the beginning of this section, if you're using Protocol of Sun Storm, that's going to help massively because you're still going to be able to fire with these vehicles while doing that action. So that's the Shadow Operations all complete. Out of the three of those, I quite like the idea of Ancient Machineries. There's a lot more units in our codex that can actually do the action. All the core units and all the canoptic units, there's a lot of those. Where some of the other options are only limited to infantry units or with the example of retrieved Nephilim data, it opens the door to Tomb Blade bikers but they're still quite restricted in comparison to ancient machineries. Now don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean to write off raise the banners high because if you've got a lot of infantry models within your list, lots of Necron Warriors, lots of Necron Immortals, Death Marks, Flayed Ones, then yeah, this is going to work just fine if you're taking and raise the banners high. So guys, that completes our video for today, how to score secondary objectives with the Necron Codex. In the next video of this series, we're going to be talking about how to deny points from your opponents, again, using that Necron Codex. So yeah, guys, if you found this video interesting or found it useful, please subscribe below. We have recently hit 7,000 subscribers and we're now on our way to 8,000. So guys, all I have to say is thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one.